Okay, so recording is started. Um, so I'll start off with introducing myself. I'm April Shaw. I am pretty sure I've talked to or emailed almost everyone here. Um, and I am the Librarian of Government Services and Reference at the Department of Libraries. And I am also in charge of Clover and the Career Service. Um, and everyone always apologizes when they ask me questions about Clover, but I think you don't understand how much I love to get questions. Um, and so this is the second meeting of the Interlibrary Loan Roundtable. And I'm really excited that we're here. And I can go over the agenda after we do introductions. Um, and just a quick mention with the technology. I'm recording the meeting, but one of the weird quirks with Skype is that it will record when people have computer audio. So if you've called in on the phone and you talk, it does not record that. Um, but I think most people, it looks like, went in through the computer. Um, and that is it for me. So who would like to go next? So we introduce the group here that's all gathered and then move on to the folks who called in. Okay. I'm Jean Walsh. I'm the reference librarian here at Brooks Memorial Library. I'm Denise Post, Heartland Library. Leah Gessner, Gilbert Free Library. Allison Mater, Petty Memorial Library. John Levin, Law Library at uh, School for International Training in Brattleboro. Uh, I'm Sarah Sanfilippo. I'm from Southern Vermont College in Bennington. I'm also here as a board member of Solomon Wright Public Library in Townall. We just, um, our director just retired, so I'm helping out there for a little while. Chris Bloomfield, Springfield Town Library. Jennifer Ansock, Angel Library Loan Clerk at Brooks Memorial. Tammy Gould, Springfield Library. Eric Walsh, Murphy Library in New Haven. So that's us. Awesome. Okay, so we have some people who have called in or logged in. Um, I'll go next. Okay. I'm Wendy Sharkey. I'm from Bennington Free Library. And I can go. I'm Lee Bonamico from Aldrich Library in Barrie. All right. And I have some people who are muted because they are on the main desk. And we have Caroline from North Hero Public. Um, I failed to mention, if you look in the bottom left corner of the um, chat screen, you're going to see a little chat bubble. And if you click that, the conversation and chat box will pop out on the left so you can type too. Okay, so next up. Oh, Lisa from Norwich is here. And this is Jenny Kaur from the Shalott Library. Jenny and Lynn from Kimball. All right, that, that might be everybody. Um, that that has a mic. Um, all right. Let's see. All right. So I guess I'll start by going over the agenda because we said it three months ago, so that was a while ago. Um, so the main items that we had were to create a best practices list for interlibrary loan in Vermont. Um, we were looking for suggestions on streamlining interlibrary loan service, any creative solutions that people have come up with that work for their library. Um, but I think the ultimate goal was to create just a general best practices list that we can then post on our website and direct either new librarians or anyone that needs a refresher to those. Um, and then the second item we had was discussing advocacy for interlibrary loan in Vermont and how to show how important it is. Um, 
tied into the best practices list, I got an email suggestion of creating a list of libraries that don't lend new titles or a um, audiovisual because I looked and the last time we had created one of those lists was in 2015 so I suspect it's out of date and there is a way to find that in Clover but it's complicated um, and it's not easily found so I think just a list would probably be an easier solution but I'm wondering if anyone else had any better ideas um, and then the other agenda item I had suggested was to bring up Yes, if those, yes, Lynn, if those libraries um, have it set to be skipped, then they're skipped. But someone mentioned that they've seen libraries that don't lend new books requesting new books. So there's the whole reciprocal lending issue. Um, and so the other op item that was sent to me was um, bringing up that some times the Clover and the library system due dates don't match um, because Clover automatically generates the due date set on the lending period but it doesn't take into account weekends or days that the library is closed and I know that I'm pretty sure Koha does do that and so um, sometimes people are getting overdue notices when a book is not when the due date in Clover says they still have it for another week or two or something like that so those are the things that people wanted to talk about. Um, did we want to start with the best practices? I'm going to open a Word document so I can keep up with these. Okay, so first one in is Lending Library should include a label for returning the item. Caroline says she has a box of labels she never goes through. Yeah, so including um, a label for returning the item is pretty handy. You don't like sending extras out. Yeah, so if everyone would, I'll put that in, is include a return label. That's a mailing or a return label? Um, I believe it counts as either. We include both of them when we send them out. We include one for USPS if it's going out that way, and we include one of our courier labels if it goes out that way. And I know that's been a big problem with out-of-state libraries. If we is we've run into a bunch that just don't include any kind of mailing label, and then some of them don't even have a property stamp. So I will say, if you receive an out-of-state library loan um, and it doesn't have any indication of where to return it, you can always check with me, and I can look it up in the original OCLC request and tell you. What we do is, um, if we get a book in that doesn't have any sort of indication where it's come from, we look on the envelope before we discard the envelope, because then it usually has the return address on there. We learn the hard way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I call people. <laughs> yeah. It's a really easy thing for me to look up, so I never mind when people do that. <laughs> All right, so include return label when sending an item out. Um, do we want to include in the best practices, make sure the Clover and the ILS due dates match? So that is kind of just a nice thing to add in. I know it adds an extra layer of work for some people, but it does make it convenient when you're looking up your interlibrary loans. That, that certainly makes sense that we would know when it's really good. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I'll fully admit that we messed that up with some of the out-of-state loans. We're working on it, but... Isn't the um, due date in Kohog usually like two weeks before the October? Um, that would really shorten the length of the loan. Which one would you be matching? Would you be matching to Clover? Um, I would match it to your loan policy. So the only places that you can change the due date of an item is when you're marking it as shipped, you would set the due date there before you hit submit, and then when someone requests a renewal. Other than that, there's no status that allows you to edit the due date. So... Oh, and Lynn asked um, for the settings in Clover, if you put in 35 days, does that include the days you say you're off? And it does not. It just goes calendar days. So it doesn't skip any of the off days. Oh. Which is why it ends up not matching what your ILS says. But am I right that that it is something you can set up once just to make sure that your, say, COHA system and the Clover are giving the same amount of time, and then it's good to go? Or you don't have to do it. Um, item, do so you? you should double check with each request just because um, I'm, my understanding of COHA is that it will adjust the due date based on days that your library is closed. Right. Clover does not. It just goes that many days from the day it's marked shipped. Right. So it's not going to skip, um, say you're closed on Sundays, it won't skip Sundays, it's just going to include those. There's no way in the system right now to tell it to skip those days. I see. So okay. each time it'll do that, and each time it will have to be adjusted. Yes. So what we really need to do is get people to adjust the checkout date on their uh, ILS system because you preset how many days you're willing to loan out of an item within Clover when you set up all your settings. Yes. Um, you choose whether it's 45 days or however long. Yes. So you've got to then just match that to your checkout date on your ILS. Yes, and I think for the most part it matches. But if the due date ends up being a day that you're closed, I think Koha will bump it to the next day or the day before that, and Clover does not do that. Do we know if Koha is smart enough to uh, alter that depending on the patron type? I'm not actually sure about that. I don't have Koha, so I can't check in the settings. Oh, Be Lisa worth. says yes. I would say that it is, if you have your patron type set such that all your ILL libraries are set up as ILL libraries, then we could have it such that uh, in Koha you can check out everything for a certain length of time. Yes, so Lisa and Lynn do. in the chat both said you can set due dates for libraries. So it would depend on if you have them set up as libraries or as just regular patrons. Yeah, yeah. That would be handy. But not everyone's on Koha, but that is a thing that has been brought up so if it's an easy fix that would be great um, I love easy fixes but it may not be for some people um, I think just cutting down on the number of times that people are getting overdue notices for titles that Clover thinks is not due yet um, would probably be nice um, so I guess we'll put in Make sure Clover and ILS due dates match, um, if possible. Okay. April. Yes. This is Jenny at the Charlotte Library, and I have a question about um, putting in due dates. Yes. Um, I was wondering in Clover, when you go to um, the lender's pending list, if mm -hmm. there's a way to be able to put a due date box there rather than having to open up each item individually and, and put in the due date there. When you open the lender, um, the lender's pending list, and you can just say shipped, and you can also put the due date there. And same thing with the lender's renew list. 
There's not, but that would actually make it so much easier. I can bring that up to auto graphics. Right now, the okay. only way to adjust um, a due date is to open the detail view. But that's a, mm -hmm. that's good. I like that one. Okay. Well, thank you. April. Yes. When you're when you're in that pending list. Mm hmm And I the book is out. I never know what to tell the other library how long you're going to have to wait for it. I mean, I know it's going to be two weeks, maybe. But I have the book, and it will be back. Should I just say, will not supply, or is something we should tell everybody? Uh, be I, so I that? mark it as will not supply, and if you open it, there's always a secondary reason line, and one is in use. Okay. And so that marks it as um, retry, <laughs> which means that they know it's currently checked out but they can resubmit the request after okay that's what i did yesterday and i'm there is that the right way the other yes. thing i we're uh, we lend new books mm -hmm. i never check to see if somebody asking for a book lent their new books okay should we do that i mean should i i never worried about it i just sent it yeah, we send out everything, too. Um, I guess it's more if it's um, an issue that a lot of people feel strongly about. Like, if you don't lend new books, should you be requesting new books? Is that Does it upset people if they receive requests for newer AV items from a library that they know won't send it out? It depends on the differing policies, but I think the general practice has always done been don't request if you don't lend those item types. Um, and we can put that in best practices, but we don't really have to police it. Okay. I mean, it's just another step you'd have to go through the list. And... Yes, which drives some people crazy having to check the list. Generally, we just send the items out. I, I also, it seems to me, if you did a general request, you could, in good faith, be thinking you're not requesting a new item, but it happens to be new in whatever library gets it. Could that? Right. That, that does happen, happen sometimes. But, yeah, it makes sense to me, like, have it as a best practice, but don't try to please. Okay. Like that sounds good to me. Should we, do you like the idea of creating a list of libraries that don't lend new or AV? Or ones that do lend new or AV, or should just incorporating that into best practices be enough? I say keep it simple and don't try generating new lists. That's okay. Me. I like that one. <laughs> okay. Oh, it looks like everyone in chat agrees as well. All right, we will incorporate and not create new lists, and we will just go with good faith in people. I, I, have, a, I have a general question. I'm just curious. Um, mm -hmm. What's the time period that people feel like it's considered new? Like if it's published in June of 2018, right. I mean, it doesn't really affect the question here, but I'm just kind of curious what libraries think new mm -hmm. is. It varies a lot, I think. We generally go six months. But for us, it's more requesting out of state because if we get something, we just we we send it out. It doesn't matter if it's new. Um, we don't have a separate new category. Um, and for out of state requesting, people will often not send it to someone from a different state unless it's been out for a year. So we stuck with six months. Oh, and. In the chat, Caroline says three to four months after publishing, and Lisa says Vocal has it set up for six months. Uh, Catamount has it set up for six months for books and a year for audiovisual. Okay. One thing is uh, for us that basically something, it's generally six months from acquisition date, which for most of like the best sellers isn't much different than the publication date. But right. uh, obviously, for requesting, you can't go with, you can't figure out what when the other library acquired it. So you have to go with publication. So it's a little bit different. So 
Right. But we should bother April if we know the book is published six months ago or three months ago, not ask for an out of state loan on it, right? Right. Um, and sometimes people do send out a request for something that was published three months ago just in the hopes that another public library has it available and it cycles through everyone who owns it and it ends up with our out of state account and we just say, will not supply because it hasn't been out long enough and that's fine. Okay. We have that ILL request for patrons who want something that's going to be published in about three months from right. now. <laughs> <laughs> I did once get one for a book and they, I had to tell them that I would request it but it hadn't been published yet and I would try <laughs> in at least a month when it came out. Those are the best ones. <laughs> Okay. All right. Do we have anything else that we want to add to the best practices? Um, maybe something about how often they should check in Clover, if they, especially if they don't have email alerts set up. I think right now the agreement on our website actually says to make sure you check it twice a week. Yeah, How often? I check it every day that we're open and that I'm there. So I don't check it on Saturdays, but Tuesday to Friday, several times a day, just to check in really quick. Okay. And Caroline, yeah, just twice a week. Okay. Oh, and Lynn has asked people, oh, yeah, that's a good one. Keep an eye on different statuses um, because sometimes they request a renewal and it takes a long time to be either responded to or it never gets responded to. And sometimes books are not checked in even when um, they are returned. So we should probably put in something about making sure to check all statuses. Yes, yeah. I'm really guilty about renewing. But at least I, you admit it. <laughs> <laughs> I forget. I don't care. But sometimes I just go and renew everything. <laughs> um, Maria asks if communication about specific items go through a library supplied email because phone messages often lose something in translation and an email to the whole group seems not quite appropriate. Um, all libraries should have an email listed in their participant record and you can actually look it up um, by going to ILL admin and then um, I believe it's look up library information. Um, I'm working on getting a report that tells me which libraries have no contact information listed, especially in email, and that way I can reach out to them and say, please go and check up your check on your participant record because there's no contact information. Yes, I email does seem like a much more direct way. I'm hoping to get everyone to add an email in there. That does remind me, I'll send out another blast asking people to update. There was a Google Doc with ILL addresses. I'm not sure how often people update that. Um, that one, I, I don't know if it was started by an individual or by VLA. I think I, I don't know if I have the link for that one. All right. Yeah, I think uh, Lynn said that she had a few instances where renewal was rejected and then reached out to the library directly and they were surprised and renewed it. And I think some of those I checked and the format type they had listed in their lending policies was accidentally set to no, don't renew. So the system automatically rejected it. Um, I do. I find that if you have a question about a specific loan, it never hurts to send an email or a phone call because sometimes the system does do weird things or something was set up wrong and 
just no one knew it yet. Check. All passes. All right, so I will add in best practices to make sure um, contact information is listed in the participant record, is especially including an email. Is there a way to delete completed? To what? To delete when um, the item is complete. Yes. And also expired. Oh, no. the expired ones. Um, okay, so the trick with deleting requests is you can only delete the ones that you initiated as a borrower. After a year, anything that is complete or expired will delete itself automatically unless the um, borrower has already deleted it. So the borrower can delete? The borrower can delete completed requests. The lender cannot. And one thing on deleting the completed records is that they do stay in the statistics. So it, it's really helpful. Like we've got I think 600 and some odd items and completed you know, in terms of the lending are, I go through and delete our borrowed items after they've been complete for a month. So if there's a month that they're still in there in case there's a problem or get an overdue notice or something like that. So we are still got a record of it, but then after that, get rid of that so that, so that you prune the list down the way you can actually go through the um, you go to the completed, uh, click on, on the screen on the part on your uh, borrowed items, you click on completed and look at the list. And then there's a, like a drop down next to each item. You and basically you update the status to delete. And and um, you can, there's like a, I think a gear icon where you can adjust what columns appear and you can tell it to show uh, date of last change, which would be the date that you have to complete it. And then sort it by that column and then you've got the oldest stuff first. And then Are we required to keep records of um, journal articles within the five-year copyright. Thing. Um, I would. It, I think that would be a. That's an individual thing. Um, if it's okay. something that we have filled for you, we actually track it. We do. So, so it's being tracked so that we're in compliance with ILL policies. It is. Okay. So, all right. And then we might choose to keep them here just so we can keep track. That would be fine. Yeah. But, but yes, I can I can go into OCLC and run a report for us, and I also track them in a spreadsheet. Okay. That's good to know. Yes. All right. What else? Is there anything else we want in best practices? The question um, on uh, marking ILL is shipped. Mm -hmm. Deliveries in and out twice a week, mm -hmm. uh, Wednesday and Friday. So on Tuesday, I'm putting the items in the courier bag and putting it in the bin. Right. Is it okay to mark it as shipped when I know it's going the next day, or can I only mark it as shipped the day of, or does it even matter? I mark it as shipped the day I put it in a bag, even okay. if the pickup's not until the next day. Okay, that's what I do, but I wasn't sure because I, if the courier comes Wednesday morning, I put something in Wednesday afternoon, it's not going out till Friday. Right. Uh, you can change the shipped date if you want to, but generally I just mark it as shipped. And then if I'm receiving something from a courier and they mark it as shipped, I actually look at the schedule to see when their pickup was and get an idea of when I can expect it. Okay. As, uh, on the best practices uh, theme, I wonder uh, that that status of will supply mm -hmm. um, 
can be confusing and that has to be updated, right? It seems like to add a layer of complication. Right, um, especially with the undo shipped option that's been added. Um, and Lynn adds that she tried to use will supply, but she was forgetting to switch them to shipped. So now she just marks it as shipped when she puts it in the bag. So, and I know a lot of libraries just skip over the will supply and go straight to shipped, which is easy because then you can just put the due date in, mark it as shipped, and it's done. Um, I generally say go with what works best for your library. If you forget to update to shipped, um, then it's probably better to just go straight to shipped instead of using will supply. Um, it, I, I think it's what works best for your workflow. Some people mark it as will supply so that it doesn't move on and then they go check the shelves and some people just mark it as shipped and then go check the shelves. Um, I think a best practice would be to always um, mark it as will supply or shipped so that it doesn't move on to another library in the meantime because I've seen some that um, just never mark it as supplied or shipped and then it moves to another library and they get two copies. Um, Lisa, once you mark it as shipped, you can change it. There's an undo shipped option. And if that's not showing up for you, let me know and I can go in and fix that. But I had them apply that to all admins system wide. We had a question about how quickly it does move yeah, on. Yeah, so for like in oh. have volunteers kind of helping out these days with mm -hmm. absence. Um, so our person who's helping with interlibrary loan is only there on Mondays. But if we know we've got a book and we can have someone pull it, we should probably mark will supply I'm wondering how quickly before, if we ignore it for a couple of days. Okay, so the how quickly it moves on actually depends on the number of days you have marked as days will supply in your participant record. And the default for everyone was originally set at four days. And what I have ha asked people to do is change that to match the number of days in a week that they process interlibrary loan because the number of days it sticks there is tied to the number of days you process. It's not there for four calendar days. It's there for four days that you process interlibrary loans. So if you only process one day a week and you only have one day checked off in your participant record, then it will sit there for four weeks before it moves on to another library. Uh, wait. Can you go that? Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes, it's 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 probably the most frustrating thing I have with the system right now. So if your day su to supply is set at four, and let's say you process requests on Tuesday and Thursday, it will stick in your account without moving on for two weeks for four processing days if you just ignore it. But if you process four days a week, let's say you process Monday through Thursday, it will arrive on, say, Sunday and on, I think, Wednesday, no, Thursday at midnight, it will move on to the next library on the list. Now, is that, uh, now how does it know how often you process? Is it like every time you log in, it's counting it as a No, it's the um, days requests are processed checkboxes that are in your participant record. Mm -hmm. So those are the two fields in Clover that determine how long a request sits with your library. It's the days to supply and the days requests are processed. So, so I told people the best practice for that would be to mark the days to supply as the number of days that you process requests in a week and that way it never sits with you for more than a week. Like say so, like everybody in an interlibrary loan or the whole library is sick and no one thinks, oh, let's put holiday dates up. Then it's easier to just have it set up that way so that it doesn't stay for more than a week. Got it. Can you add that in the best practices? Because I would say that most of us weren't aware of that, of how that works. Yeah, I can do that. 
put in screenshots for that one too. <laughs> Alright. So here in Bennington we've still got, we put um, sleeves on our books before we send them out. Mm -hmm. And we are, still get a lot of them returned without the sleeves, which makes it harder for us to process them when they do come back in. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'd like really for people to leave the sleeves there if they're there. <laughs> I can do that. I think we have to jail the patrons, Wendy. I think that's really the only answer. It, I know. We actually... It, it, it's not bad, but it just makes it bad. Yeah. Uh, we've we had, we had books coming in from two directions, and we like to separate them out. <laughs> yes, we end up, we actually, um, we ig ignore the sleeves, and I take them off and keep them in a folder. <laughs> And I don't send anything back unless I've checked the folder and put everything back with that return. That's what I used to do. Yes. Okay, so we can add in if book straps, sleeves, or paperwork are included. Make sure it is included when returned. I know some places switch to um, reusable labels that just stick right on the front and then they're less likely to lose it, but oh, that's kind of a big budget item, so. All right, so return all paperwork. All right. What else? I'm, I'm going to send this out on the ILL listserv also, um, just as like one last poll to make sure everyone gets to voice what they think should be in the best practices. And then before I post it, I'll just send out the whole final document to see what people think of it. April, do you want to know when we get a duplicate copy of a book? Yes, because then I can figure out um, why there was a duplicate and if find out if it was a system error or a person error. And if it's a person error, it's just an easy way to remind them, hey, you, you, you marked this as will not supply and sent it anyway, and that's a little confusing. It's mostly out of state. That one is harder, but I still email them and say, why did you send a copy and not mark it as shipped? But, I think yeah. it would be helpful to see um, if people are using paper-based request forms, what those look like. Oh, that might be something I can just send out on the listserv and ask them. Okay. Oh, Caroline asked, do you mean when a patron re requests something? Yes. Yes, that's what I assumed you meant. Okay. Yeah, I can send the email out on the listserv and ask, too. Does anyone here use paper-based request forms? Yeah, we still do. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people. Okay. Yes, Caroline does as well. Mm -hmm. All right, so it looks like a lot of people do. Okay. Yeah, I can put together an email and ask people to let me know what they look like or tell me what they ask for information on there, too. All right. All right. Do we have anything else to add to best practices? I have um, a question about misdirected items. Mm -hmm. um, we get a lot of items that are supposed to be for Hartford, and they oh. come to us, Heartland. Um, but you had a few things misdirected just out in the ether, and 
I would ask that maybe use the best practice, I would guess, would be to forward it to the library it's supposed to go to. Yes. Um, it's not what happens sometimes, and then the item gets held up for weeks. Um, play an email tag, and I would think that if it's not meant for you, stick it back in the courier and out it goes. That is what usually seems to happen. Sometimes people email me and say, I got this item and all it has is a property stamp. Who is it supposed to go to? So I usually look it up in the Clover system and see if it was going to someone or if it was being returned and was just misdirected. Um, when you say misdirected, do you mean they put in the wrong label or the courier sorted it incorrectly? Either or. Either it, or. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, um, oh, it's okay. St. Hartford on the tag, or it'll say Heartland, but the item was actually meant for Hartford. It, it, both ways. OK, so how about I add double check that you are putting the right career or mailing label on the item. And if you receive something that is addressed to another library, put it back in the courier and send it to the correct one. I, I would make a plea to even if it's sent through the mail, that you mm -hmm. mail it on to the, just with a sense of, um, you know, it, that we all have, that those mistakes happen and, and, and it's just a friendly agreement that, you know, next time we'll be the beneficiary of that policy. Okay. Okay, I can add that in too. But we can still contact you and ask you. <laughs> yes, you can. Excellent. <laughs> you can always email me. Oh, and Kate Davy wonders if we want to revive that staples versus tape debate. <laughs> oh, let's let's avoid that one. That one's always a touchy subject. <laughs> All right. Got that and that and that. Okay. Um, so that's a solid start for best practices. Um, if we want to keep on time, did we want to give it another few minutes with best practices and then move on to advocacy and also deciding what we want to talk about for our next meeting and scheduling our next meeting? So we could send this, spend the second hour talking about those. I guess one last call for anything best practices. All right. I think it's a good start. And we can always look at it at the next meeting and update it even further if we want. We could put in a rule that says never mention staples versus tape. <laughs> <laughs> like Fight Club. <laughs> oh. Okay. oh, that was a crazy noise. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, so... We'll call that the solid start for best practices. Um, all right, did we want to move on to advocacy for interlibrary loan? I know I said at the last meeting I would um, send out a list of top requested items in Clover for the month, and I did that for September. Um, I'm going to do it for October, and in theory, every month going forward. Um, is there any other data that you think we should pull that would be turned into like easy promotional um, this is why we interlibrary loan this is why you should love and fund interlibrary loan ideas well it would be interesting I think to look at the um, top requests over time mm -hmm. especially in terms of purchasing decisions like if we're not on the courier service, and um, I think that we're making a decision about looking at some postage data to decide whether we should go on with the courier service. Mm -hmm. but if the top requested books 
cost less than fifteen dollars a week a stop, maybe we should just buy those books. Right. You know, just to kind of look at like how, how often the top requested books are in the top list of requests over time, and okay. then and what that means for materials collection and acquisitions. Okay. Do you mean like over six months or over a year? I guess. You know. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I don't know what what data you have and how easy it would be to put that together. But so you know, what I can do is I can actually pull. Um, I think I I lost the August 2017 chance. Um, I can pull all requests that were made, and I've been getting into the habit of pulling those every month. Um, it's more that it would take some time to pile it all into one spreadsheet and then sort by title and with the way that some records are. It's just it would take a little bit of time, which is why I'm wondering how often you would want it because it's, it's doable. It's just yeah, I think it would be interesting like if, if there's certain books that are in the top request list for a lengthy period of time or if it's more like a, a flash and you know one month this book was really popular because it was top or and even what it means to be in the top request does that mean it was asked for four times or four hundred times? Okay. Spring, summer, winter, fall. I I will also say that um, book club requests are included, and those tend to skew the results every once in a while. Yeah. Um. You know, I'll start off with a six-month report and go from there. Maybe every New Year's I can do a, these were the top ones requested this year. Somehow on the other end of it, it would be interesting. And also I've been just hearing so much about how, um, you know, in library advocacy, telling stories, you know, even telling stories with your data. So like mm -hmm. around the group, sometimes we're like amazed at, some of the more obscure things we're able to get for people who have a very specific need and they would have no other means to get it. Yes. So um, I'm not sure how captured, yeah. you know, but I can I can cruise through the title list and pick out really weird ones and send um, those. Yeah. Uh, Kate Davy also said a sample of cool or obscure topics that were covered in the requests. So yeah, I could add that into what I send out every month or maybe every year pick out like these are some of the really strange ones that we got. <laughs> yeah, I think if you look at the least requested things, you probably that was where those that list would be. There yeah. are a lot of requests that are requested just once. Um, I just had my sheet. There's roughly 5,000 requests made every month. So. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good. That was July, and I think it was around the same amount in September. So, um, I mean, Lynn asked about, um, let's see, quarterly. Caroline suggests quarterly for the reports of most requested. Um, Lynn said they look at how many times they borrow a title, and if it's three in a year, they most likely would purchase it. Um, and she asked if this would be specific to each library. It's any, any report I run is generally not specific to a library unless I ask it to be. I can run a system-wide report. So when I send out an email that says these are the most requested, it's system-wide, which is how I end up with a list of 5,000 requests made. <laughs> I mean, that, that, this, that, that sort of thing will help us choose whether to purchase a, an extra copy of a book or something like that. But um, the other side of the, the equation is the money side of it. So um, how many books are being supplied to courier libraries as opposed to um, non-courier libraries? Because that, you know, that gives you things like uh, postage costs and things like that. So everyone can run individual reports for their requests. Um, the trouble is there's no way to indicate in Clover which is a courier and which is a USPS library. So what you end up having to do is download the requests and then sort by library. And then you could just mark if it's a courier or non-courier. Um, that's the best suggestion I've had for people looking for courier stats. 
but there's not really any report that I have found that will give me that information easily. Is, is there a way to get that sort of information from the reports that we send in every month? Um, With how many items? Yeah, you send yeah. via courier and receive. Yeah, yeah, I can send out a summary yeah. of those. I could send a summary of courier stats. Because I'm thinking, you know, courier stats are, are great for, um, you know, do we need an extra stop uh, a week? Do we need a stop less a week? Um, yeah, and I don't think we've ever sent out, like, just a full report of I mean, I know it saves money for libraries, but I don't think we've ever sent out like a report of this is how many items were sent through the courier and this is how many went through USPS and this is how much was saved. It's on my list. I'll work on that for the, hopefully for the new year. Yeah. Um, and Lisa asked, do we know if using Clover has significantly increased requests and if so, by how much it has? Um, it has definitely increased the number of requests I heard from a lot of libraries. Um, I'm not sure by how much. I, um, I can't, so I have never filled out the annual report. Does anyone know if the annual report includes a number of interlibrary loans? It does. Oh, but it's there. I'm asking Josh right now. Um, yes, yeah, so apparently it, it is a form. Um, so I can look at last year, I can look at the different years and tell you how much it changed by, since as long as everyone reports it. <laughs> but I know that we had to look at the number of interlibrary loan requests that were processed when we sent out an RFP, like six forever ago for the courier service. Um, I think it's a combination, uh, Lynn asked if it's due to Clover or courier, and I think it's a combination of both. Because my under, my under based on feedback that I got, once Clover launched, a lot of libraries reported that they were receiving more requests, and it's just because their catalogs and their items were much more discoverable in the new system. <coughs> Let me see. All right, so I can look into that and see what I find for changes in request volume. Because Clover is really easy to track the request volume because the request number is <laughs> that how that's how many requests have been made so far. Not all of them have been filled. And I'm guessing roughly 50 or so are me testing different things, but that's that's how many requests have been made since August 1st of last year. And I think we're up to, if we're not at 80,000, we're really close. Do we know the number that are not ever filled? Um, I don't know if I've downloaded that report. I can find out. Curious. Yeah. Um, generally, I know most impressive. of them have been filled, but it's included in the, you can download um, statistics every month and it actually tells you how many are not filled. For yourself? Yes. But so quite, I think so. I can find a system-wide report that would tell me. You know, if you have a 99% chance of getting what you want when you ask for an interlibrary loan, that would be a good thing. Yes, and Lynn points out that that's tough because if one comes back as unfilled or retry, a new request is sometimes made for the same item. Right. So that's a good point. Unfilled doesn't necessarily represent that that item was never found, but I can make a comparison of um, filled versus not filled and see what the percentage is just for something to look at. While we're on that subject, April, if mm -hmm. it's unfilled and we have to do it again, mm -hmm. we give it, it gets a new number, should we cancel the old number or delete the old number? If it's in unfilled, it's already gone through the cycle. So if you canceling it and deleting it, we'll do the same thing. Right, but for your count, does it make any difference? It's already going to be counted as unfilled. 
so it's not going to make any difference. Okay. I realized they went away if I did it. But yes. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I have to do that because for some reason I can't retry it because of whatever. It depends on the reasons people marked it as will not supply a lot of times. And Caroline says that um, for unfilled, she deletes it just to clear the screen. Oh, okay. I know a lot of people like to keep the numbers down on some of those, and it makes it easier to find things. All right. So I have some more reports to run. Um... For advocacy, has anyone had any, like, great successes advocating for ILL that they want to share or any ideas of what you think could happen? I know that last time there was talk about um, having VLA maybe advocate at legislature or something like that. I like the idea of collecting odd requests and maybe making a place in the library where we say we requested 50 books this month. The oddest one in the state was for how to grow pigeons or something. <laughs> I can do that. That will probably be one of the more fun reports that I get to do. <laughs> <laughs> it would be a fun report. We could give a prize for the oddest one at the end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we'll start with more information to push how awesome the service is then. I can do that. All right. Because um, our patrons come in and they're not sure what they can request into library loan. Oh, that's a good point. You don't really understand, you know, they're not all sure of what's going on. Yeah. Or if it costs money or whatever. Mm-hmm. They hesitate sometimes, and I have to say, oh, just give me the title. <laughs> Oh. Yes. I know. Public libraries run across that very often. But yeah, it's yeah. something to let your patrons know that you don't have to pay the publishers for this stuff. Okay, so promoting okay. ILL to the patrons, like best ways to do that and make sure that. They're aware it's a program that exists, and these are things that you can request. Um, and I think most libraries, it's a free service. But I, I really understand the please don't pay $49 for the article. I almost cried when a student told me they did that. Yeah. OK. Well, I, I was a, like a regular citizen 30 years ago. I wouldn't have thought to go to my public library to ask for a research article. Right. right. So maybe one of our um, next meetings or even just a discussion on the ILL listserv is like what materials do you use to promote this service to your patrons? How do you promote it? Um, how aware of it are your are your patrons? What like we used to do presentations to students and then Every time I make a presentation to state employees, I explain about interlibrary loan and tell them about how it works. But, I mean, do public libraries just have a sign up that says interlibrary loan? Here's here's this awesome thing that you can use. Do we want to share promotional materials that you might have? Seems like a good idea. All right. All right. It would also be interesting for a cost-benefit analysis. Um, we, our library has me, part-time staff, and some lovely volunteers. 
and it's a, a volunteer who's really doing the main part of the ILL and we're non-career and our post office has a two hour a day lunch break. Oh. <laughs> So it's a lot of time and effort and money. And without the volunteer, you know, I, I couldn't also do that. Um, so I think that that's an important thing to consider. So we, we're not heavily pushing ILL because it's so much time and effort per book plus the shipping costs and everything. You know, we, we do it, and we, we because I've just started working there recently, mm -hmm. we're not um, we're not lending. Although some librarians call and say, "I know that you're on pause, but I know that you have this. Can you just send it to me?" Which we're doing, um, but we are borrowing. Um, and you know, it, it's it's a great service. And I come from a state with a library system that had amazing, you know, like daily three stops of couriers statewide and, well, region-wide in Western Massachusetts. And, you know, I'm very experienced using it, but it's quite, our experience of it is very different. And I support it in theory, but in practice, it, it's a tremendous amount of time and effort to process one book. Right. So I think that rather than having like a one set of promotional materials, it would be nice to have a bank of things that people can draw from and, you know, and think about using. And if it were, if the courier service were free because of some sort of legislative act or something like that, you know, that would make things a lot easier and obviously less expensive. I would love if the courier service was free. I can't <laughs> actually promote that. Um, I'm not allowed to advocate. So um, if we could have a VLA meeting where something was organized, that would be amazing. Um, but yeah, the idea of a bank of promotional items to draw from would be amazing. I know that there was, it's, um, it hasn't been updated in a while, I think because the people who ran it left the libraries. Um, there used to be a library marketing and outreach Google site that hosted materials. So if, there, if there's the potential to maybe create promotional materials for Vermont libraries and then just host them all on this one like Google Drive or something, that would be nice. So maybe the next meeting I can ask people to come with or just send me their examples of promotional materials that they have made, I mean, not just for ILL, maybe for just a brochure or something, and we could start putting them all in one Google Drive. That would be great. All right. <coughs> Let me look into that. I think that's something that could be started pretty easily. I mean, before the courier, the elders didn't want to really, the board didn't want to really promote ILL because the postage was so expensive. Right. But now, we're buying it anyway, so they might as well have more books. <laughs> you know what I mean? All right. So I'll work on that, too. But yes, I think a statewide courier would be great. I'm we're still limited like we don't own the service so it's a limit of where the vendor can and will go but yeah that sounds great I would I mean if this is something that people would like to have advocated for in legislature then I mean it's something that individuals could bring up or contact your representatives at VLA and see if it's if it's a project they have time to work on right now. Well, the state um, wants everybody to access the internet. We should have access to the query. That would be nice. Um, uh, Lynn has asked with partnerships between publics and schools, what type of payment sharing is there? Um, I've been encouraging partnerships between public and school libraries for sharing courier stops. I encourage partnerships between any libraries for the, sh the courier stops. The payment sharing is up to the individual libraries, though. 
Um, the grants that we give only go to public libraries um, because that is one of the restrictions on the funding, I believe. Um, and there's been different different splits with those. There's a document on the career site that lists the um, details of some of the partnerships. Some have created official MOUs. Um, some just have one library paying for all of it. Some split it equally and some split it not as equally based on what each library can afford. So there's a huge variety of the payment sharing there. But yeah, we're up to, let me find my schedule. I just had it. Um, I can tell you exactly how many libraries are on the courier system right now. And it's amazing. Let me see, just based on the expanding partnerships. We have 111 libraries on the courier service right now. So that's not just public libraries. It's public libraries, schools, academics. And it, every, every few weeks, I get an email from another library that's worked out a partnership. So it's expanding. I'd like to know if there's any information on, um, and I stepped out for a second, so mm -hmm. What, any information on libraries that aren't on the courier service? Like, are we keeping track of why they're deciding not to join? Is it their location or the cost or? Some of them it's the location um, because there's some that say they're interested in joining and then the courier just doesn't go to that area or it's beyond their um, Roots, and then there's some that told me that they just do so little interlibrary loan that it's not cost effective for them to join the courier. So there's a variety of reasons. Every once in a while it pops up on the listserv, but I haven't done any like formal survey of why libraries are not on the courier. All right. All right. Um, so I think I think we covered everything on the agenda. Um, did we want to go into what we want to cover for our next meeting? Because I know the goal was to have something that we actually produce and something that we discuss. And it sounds like we already have something that we want to produce, which is sharing um, marketing materials, specifically for ILL, but any marketing materials that libraries use. Um, what did we, what else did we want to discuss at the next meeting? I can, I can look up, um, what we listed as priorities um, in our first meeting and see if any of those work. We had making interlibrary loan financially feasible, um, making the board aware of the importance of interlibrary loan and awareness throughout libraries and specifically in school libraries. And we also had the idea of collection development coordination between libraries in Vermont and the idea of some hosting specific niches of collections. Um, and the idea of creating a bare bones open access resources was also tossed out there. Anyone want to vote on what we have for our next agenda? I can just pick one at random and email it and it'll be like a surprise. <laughs> surprise. Surprise. 
Alright, so we have the marketing material, sharing, and a surprise. <laughs> okay, um... April, did anybody ever generate a list of which libraries thought their collection had the most of? You know, I mean, like, Barry's got all that labor stuff, because the director was into labor. We did not. That could be something that we put together at a meeting also. I would guess everybody's got some little collection of things that we all don't have. All right. All right, instead of a surprise, I'm going to make that the next topic. <laughs> okay. Um, and Lynn asked, what does bare bones resources mean? It's just a basic, like, bibliography of different resources. I say bare bones. It's left over yeah. from when I worked in CBC, and there were all the bare bones lists. It's stuck in my head for now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, and do we have any idea of where we want to meet next? We've done Central Vermont, Southern Vermont, is there, what area should we aim for next? Does anyone want to volunteer their library? Well, we're in Central, but so. We are in Central, I mean, I can, I'm always happy to host it here again. Bennington's happy to host, but that's southern, so you yeah. know. <laughs> Maybe we should come back to the central every other meeting, you know, a central okay. or, and then like go north or go south on the alternate ones. Okay, I can do that. Okay, so I can schedule and Caroline liked having the online option. It's something I'm planning on offering for all of them going forward, so that will make it a lot easier, especially in the winter months. And when I said central, I meant your facility is wonderful, April, but also I heard from a couple of folks here who said they're in a central location, like if places wanted to host, just that's, I wanted to clarify what my comment meant. Okay. All right, so I can say I will host it here, but I can also ask if, um, like send out an email asking if anyone in the central Vermont area wants to volunteer their space. That would be nice. All right, um, and dates. If we're sticking with quarterly, then the next one would be in February. Um, so the online option is definitely going to be an option then. And I cannot recall if we stuck with Thursday for a specific reason or if it just worked better. But um, I was thinking we could look at any of the dates in that first full week of February. So the 4th through the 8th. And it would be in the afternoon because we said we would alternate morning and afternoons. I don't know if that's on like a school library um, holiday or not. I think that the February vacation for schools is usually the last week of February. Oh, I have a school calendar. Let's see. Yeah, it looks like it's the last week. Does anyone have any dates that work better or worse? My calendar says that February 5th is a lunar new year. Ah. So, so that may create conflicts if you're doing any programming or something. Mm -hmm. not about that. Okay. And Lynn has asked not Wednesday. Okay, so we will cross off the 5th and the 6th. So we have Monday the 4th and Thursday and Friday, the 7th and 8th. On Thursday seems to be working. It's yeah. just, I don't it know does. if we want to pick it up, if, if anybody isn't able to come because it's Thursday. But. I had one who said that's their teaching day, and so they couldn't. Um, but, and Lisa says Thursday afternoons is hard. Um. So how about I send out an email to see if there are any volunteers for 
hosting and then we'll just leave those three days as a possibility and that way if one works better with someone else hosting we can go with that and then, um, um, given that we're talking about february might we also set a uh, snow date a what a <laughs> snow date uh because we're talking about february yes oh and a snow date well i was thinking if the online option is there we wouldn't need a snow date, but that's a good point. Um, how about I finalize who is hosting and then book the regular date and work with them on a snow date as well, since it would also depend on their library's availability. I assume a snow date, we could just move it to the next week. Or we could move it to another state. Well, no state. <laughs> well let's, go to, let's just go to Florida. <laughs> oh, Norwich volunteered to host. I'm going to admit that geography is not one of my strong suits, and I'm not sure exactly where <laughs> Norwich is. Love White River. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's pretty close to central Vermont. Same for Queechee. Afternoons are hard. Yeah. Okay. Well, do we want to have the next meeting at Norwich? Does that sound good? It's pretty it's pretty central. It's about halfway up the state. It's off the throughway from both places. Yes. Ah, uh, we do. Lynn asked if we have a good facility. We do, um, and we have Wi-Fi in there now. <laughs> um, well, okay. So the options are we have the next meeting at Norwich, or we go back with the idea of alternating central with VT Lib and different locations. Because I'd be happy to host every other meeting and then we go to different libraries or we can stick with the idea of just going to different libraries. No votes either way. Yeah, Lynn asked if I wanted to send it out to all libraries for opinions, and I can do that. I'll send it out on the ILL listserv. Since we're going to ask for options on the date as well. Okay. I will send that out. Okay. Um, that is everything that I have on my list. I'm going to be sending out a follow-up email with the dates and asking for opinions on location. Um, is there is there anything else we wanted to cover? All right. I think it was a good successful meeting. We have a document. Uh, I will make look as pretty as possible and then send out. All right. Oh, thanks, Lynn. All right. I will be emailing all of you, and I will see you at the next meeting. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, thanks. I recommend hosting and see if you don't have to go anywhere. Yeah.